brothers and sisters, this word is so strong. I'm just asking you to be patient and take a walk with me. And if you humble yourself and allow the Lord to soften your heart, I'm telling you, this word will change your life. I just want to explain why this video is being brought to you. I was in the midst of trying to finish the next documentary. We have quite a few documentaries that we need to get done as well as dinner table messages and other projects and videos by the grace of God. But this particular documentary that I'm in the midst of doing right now is pertaining to everything going on in the Middle East with Israel and Gaza and other mysteries that are being revealed. But it's been very grieving. As many of you have seen what is going on across the earth. The hearts of many are waxing colder and colder. Second Timothy chapter three is manifesting right before your very eyes. And while I was editing this documentary, while witnessing everything going on around on the earth, the Lord spoke to me and he brought me back seven years ago to a prophetic message that was released by the Lord. It was called water in the desert. And as I'm meditating on why he's bringing me back to that message, I understood what he was saying. And he commanded me to put this documentary on hold and get this video to as many as possible. So if you're watching this, it's for a reason. Brothers and sisters, seven years ago, this prophetic word was released called water in the desert, declaring that the most high God was extending and reaching out his hands to the descendants of Ishmael, those in the Arab nations and those in the midst of Islam. to come out and turn their lives over to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not Isa the prophet, Yeshua the Almighty, the true Son of God, who didn't come off the cross, but died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day because he had to get back the keys of hell and death. Now, if you're in Islam, I'm going to ask you, what is there to run from? Why not hear what the word of the Lord is saying? Why try to turn this video off? The Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth is at the door. And every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So brothers and sisters, the reason why this video is being brought forth for such a time as this is because in the seven years from when this prophetic word was released, there has been a supernatural move of God in the midst of the Arab nations the descendants of Ishmael that are getting visions of the Son of God. They're getting visitations in their dreams and it is undeniable. Brothers and sisters, what you have to understand is the dragon is the God of this world. 
You think he wants you to know this? Is this going to be what he allows on the news? But make no mistake about it. In places like Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and the list goes on. It may not be on a wide scale where millions upon millions are turning their lives over to the true and living God within Islam. God has a special plan for the descendants of Ishmael. Those in the Arab nations, most are in Islam. So the reason why this video is being released now is because it's broken down into two messages that are really one. The first half will be a message directly to you, children of God that have been going through hard times. The second half will be for those descendants of Ishmael within the Arab nations and those that have been in and raised up in Islam. Brothers and sisters, do you think it is a coincidence that recently the prophecies of Isaiah where God will supernaturally bring forth water in the desert, literally started to come to pass. And once again, this is not making the media, the news, because the dragon is the God of this world. He's not the God of the earth. He's the God of this worldly system. And he's trying as hard as he can to stop as many as he can from paying attention to the signs that are happening, prophecies that are unraveling and have been unraveling since the birthing of the 20th century. He doesn't want you to see what is going on. He doesn't want you to put the pieces together and figure out the word of God is true. The son of God really did come to the earth and he's at the door, and that we're really in the last hour. So brothers and sisters, as water is supernaturally appearing in the desert, at the same time, the river Euphrates is almost dried up. Prophecies are happening, and as much as false teachers online who are not ordained are telling you, Oh yeah, the river Euphrates is drying up, but it can't be the prophecy because there's other things that haven't happened yet. They don't understand. The book of Revelation is not written like other books. It is not fully written in chronological order. It goes like this. But brothers and sisters, you see the handwriting on the wall, but my question is, what are you doing? Are you truly serving the Lord? Are you abstaining from sin? Are you striving to live a righteous life, to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow after Christ? But just remember what a cross represents. It's not some iced out pendant on a chain. Those that carried a cross knew when they get to the end of their destination, they had to die on that cross. It's a reminder that we have to die daily. This means when you wake up and you go through social media, you see posts on news stations and all of these things, and you see what's going on in the world between Israel and Gaza and Iran and Turkey and Russia and Ukraine and America and China, you cannot get caught up in this. Because we're really just passing through. This is not our kingdom. This is not our world. We're in the world, but we're not what? Of the world. Our citizenship is that of heaven. The king of glory is the one we answer to. So we need to remember his teachings. We need to go back and continue to study over and over again the Sermon on the Mount. This is why the world rulers hate the Messiah, because they love darkness rather than light. 
They have a thirst for power, bloodshed, and war. No mercy for their enemies. They don't care about women and children being murdered in the process. Bloodthirsty. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. When the Most High God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walked the earth in flesh and blood. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the Bible says. So the Almighty walked the earth in the midst of us. Declaring the kingdom of heaven. Telling people to repent and turn to the heavenly father. Because there are three that bear record in heaven. The father, the word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. But understand that he brought the new Testament. He taught a way that they were not ready to follow. He told them to love their enemies. And if your enemy strikes you on your cheek, you turn your other cheek and pray for those who hate you and, and despitefully use you. To bless those that try to curse you. This is something that those that dwell in the darkness cannot comprehend. But you see, you know the truth for you that are his. So have you been getting caught up in the midst of these men at war? Flesh and blood. Because I remember my Bible says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And you might say, well, servant of God, there is a time for war in the Bible. Ecclesiastes makes it very clear. There's a time for peace and a time for war. There's a time to laugh and a time to mourn. But you have to be a righteous judge. This means you can't weep and mourn over the death and murder and kidnapping of one nation but turn a blind eye to the murder and slaughter of another nation. It doesn't work that way. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has come to the earth. So you are without excuse. You cannot operate as the days of old. We have been taught a greater way. Come on. So I have to give this disclaimer before we get into this life-changing message in Revelation. Do not get caught up in the cares of this world. How are you siding for nations instead of the kingdom of heaven? Don't get swept away in this flood. Listen, let's talk about this. Now we need to talk about this. What did Jesus warn us would happen in the prophecy of the end of days in Matthew chapter 24. Look, let's save time. We've already established beyond the shadow of a doubt with the help of the most high God in past documentaries that at the birthing of the 20th century, the prophecy of Daniel started to unravel. People, planes were invented and cars and trains and people were traveling to and fro the earth so fast. And knowledge suddenly started to increase at a pace where it almost seems unreal. Can't you see? We are in the last days. And at the same time, the prophecy of Matthew began to unravel chapter 24. He warned us that there would be wars and rumors of wars. We not only had one world war, which has never happened. There's always been wars, brothers and sisters. There's been disease, of course. But this is not how people can explain away this fact. It won't work. There's nothing like this that's ever happened. But yet it didn't just happen once. We didn't just have one world war. We had two world wars. And we didn't just have two world wars. We had a plague that flooded the earth and so many 
perished. Just as our Lord God and King prophesied in Matthew 24. Earthquakes in diverse places, brothers and sisters, there's been more earthquakes in the last hundred years than there has been in the last 2000 years. Look at all the signs. But he said that nation would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But see, as many of you already know, and some of you may not, look, we're all students here. I may teach you through the power of the Lord, but I am a student as well. So let's learn together. That word nation is the word ethnos. Does that sound like it means something? That's, that's where you get the word ethnicity from. So ethnicity would rise against ethnicity and nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. Not just kingdoms as in presidents and kings and queens, but do not forget billionaire and trillionaire family bloodlines that have been operating behind the scenes longer than you think. So my question to you is this, have you been swept up in the flood of ethnos? Wow. Are you picking sides? Because in reality, the power of the tell I vision and the lighted screen that people stare at all day. And of course, this technology is used. I'm recording something and giving it to you by the grace of God. But let's not let's not act like the enemy is not using it to his advantage, brainwashing the masses, molding and shaping their thoughts to be what he wills instead of what Christ wills. But if you watch social media and you see a whole bunch of posts promoting Israel as the victim and the Palestinians as the aggressor and you see those that have been killed and those that have been kidnapped, you may build up a hatred for those in Islam, for those descendants of Ishmael. And on the contrary, if you constantly watch videos of what Israel is doing right now in Gaza and those buildings and cities being wiped out and children are being killed, you might build up a hatred for those in Israel. But the question is, is that what you're supposed to do? Or are you supposed to be praying for both sides of the fence of war? Let's bring this, let's bring this down to a more simple analogy. If you went and visited LA, and you see the Bloods and the Crips at war with each other. And you see a Blood do a drive-by and kill three Crips. And then you see the Crips do a drive-by and kill 30 Bloods. Are you not grieving for both sides? Because the numbers may not be the same. One may be doing more killing than the other. But wrong is wrong. Evil is evil. And these are people and nations that have rejected the true and living Messiah for 2000 years, brothers and sisters. So when you want to stand with a nation, instead of standing with the Messiah, when you want to side with the kingdom of the earth, instead of siding with the kingdom of heaven, God is going to judge you. Your job, your calling, my calling is to pray. For all those in the land of Israel, no matter what they are, whether they say they are a Jew, whether they're Orthodox, whether they're Muslim, and we are to pray for those in Gaza the same way. We are to pray for those in Iran. We are to pray for those in the USA. We are to pray for those in China. We are to pray for those in Russia, Ukraine, the UK, Kenya, Jamaica, Ghana, and the list goes on. You cannot get caught up in the flood of ethnos. Some of you will literally have an argument in the comment section over who you believe are the true Jews are. And that has a place 
We can talk about that another day. I, I've already spoken of that in the past and certain videos were removed when I did it. But brothers and sisters, my question is this, whether somebody is a true Jew, a true Israelite, or one that is deceived and they think they are and they're not, or even worse, one that is the synagogue of Satan, do they not all need your prayers anyways? Will they not all perish if they don't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and accept the fact that he died for their sins? He shed his blood according to the very prophet they have studied, Isaiah, as well as in the book of Psalms and other scriptures, proving without a shadow of a doubt that he shed his blood for them. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and through his stripes, through his blood, we are healed. So if they don't receive Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Almighty as their Messiah, as their Lord, as their savior, the only one that can give them righteousness and deliver them from the lake of fire to come. If they don't receive him, will not they all go to hell anyways, whether they're a true Israelite or not? And does this not also apply to those in Islam and those in Israel? So when you side with one nation or the other, instead of rising above, oh Lord, please Lord, touch the hearts of those watching this, Lord. Let's look at this very simple. All of this unmercy and all of this war and violence and pride. Look at it like a field of beasts. But there is an eagle flying over the field. Is the view the same? Are they seeing the same things? No, they're not. The beast in the field, the flesh, men, ego, pride, arrogance, desiring power instead of giving God glory. They're like the beast of the field. They can only see almost from a it's like, remember back in the day when you were a child and you played Mario for the first time in 2D. It was just 2D, just jumping. And, but then as technology improved and got faster and more powerful, now Mario is in 3D and I'm not promoting anything. I'm giving an analogy. So they can only see in like a 2D view. But the eagle, you see, the eagle can see miles ahead. He can see all around him. He can see everything happening down below. My question is, have you mounted? Ah, have you been operating as a beast? Have you been getting a taste for anger and hatred and prejudice and racism and siding with what you believe is the righteous people or the right ones instead of rising above? and mounting up your wings as eagles to be able to be in the heavenly realm. You see, Paul the apostle said, our conversation is in heaven where Christ's seat is. So if you've been caught up in the flood of ethnos, it's time for you to repent. I'm not gonna go into certain details because I'm saving some of it for this documentary. And that's even if God leads me to post it on YouTube, I might have to put it directly to the website because some things are controversial and it's by the grace of God, I'm able to upload it. But my question is this, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, are you turning a blind eye to the overkill that is happening in that little piece of land called Gaza because you have been taught no matter what I must bless a certain people. I must bless the chosen people of God. Do you think you're going to get away with that? Nah, nah. No, we're going to talk about this. Some of you are idolaters of a nation. 
Some of you idolize those that you believe are the chosen of God. And no matter what they do, you have nothing to say. You have no righteous judgment to stand on with them because I just want to bless them. So I will be blessed. And even if they do wicked things, I don't want to say anything about it, but I have no problem wanting Muslims to be wiped off the map. I have no problem seeing Gaza completely annihilated because I am a respecter of persons. Is that you? But if you truly loved Israel, if you truly loved those in Islam, if you truly loved, you would be fair and righteous in your judgment. Do you know the Bible actually says we are, we are actually supposed to judge? But we cannot judge if we're hypocrites. We cannot judge if we're doing the very same thing that we're judging. But Jesus Christ himself and other scriptures declare to judge you righteous judgment. It also says he that is spiritual judges all things. So if you're going to be righteous in your judgment, you're supposed to say you're both in sin and you're both wrong. You both need Jesus Christ and without him, you cannot have peace. That's the truth. And we are supposed to have compassion for both sides of the fence of war and pray for both sides of the fence of war because we have risen above that fence of war. We don't choose a side. We choose Christ. We don't choose a side. We choose Jesus Christ, Yeshua the, the Almighty. And if you want to bless those that are Jews, you tell them the truth that they need the Messiah, that they need Jesus Christ, that without him, they will not make it. And you have to tell those that are in Islam, if you love them, that without Jesus Christ, not Isa the prophet, without Yeshua the Messiah, the Almighty, they will not make it. Why do you think the manifested sons of God are so hated? Why do you think prophets don't really last that long on average when you read the word of the Lord? The most powerful prophet got his head cut off very quickly because we don't compromise. We're not a respecter of persons or nations. We are sent by the Most High God to declare the word of the Lord, to declare righteous judgment of God. Regardless of the threats, regardless of the faces and the anger or the backlash, we have to be fair. Have you been righteous or have you been siding with the flesh? Are you a beast of the field or have you soared up as an eagle in Christ? That is my question. Now that we've talked about this, you see what's happening in the land of Israel. And we'll talk about that in the documentary as well. We'll talk about the fact that regardless of any people that are living there, the Most High God declared that land, Israel. Rome was the ones who named it Palestine. So you have to go to the origin of the name. And I could keep going, but I'm going to wait for the finishing of this documentary by God's grace. I need you to see these prophecies. I need you to see this revelation because there's many of you, you have been going through such hard time. You have been struggling. We get so many emails, y'all. Messages. So many that feel like giving up. They feel like God has abandoned them, forgotten them. As if he's sent them off into a desert. And although he is the Lord God of heaven and earth and his streets are made of gold. You feel like he's thrown you a bottle of water and a half a loaf of bread and walked away from you. And see, this is a perfect opportunity for that old serpent to slither in and try to whisper in the ear, to divine doubt, rejection, abandonment, and say, God don't love you. 
Look at all your sufferings. Look at how much you are in a desert with barely any water, barely any bread. Whatever that could represent for you. For some of you, it's literal. You're barely getting by in the natural realm. But for some of you, it's a, a spiritual dryness, a spiritual desert, a mental desert. Struggling with depression and fear and doubt and sadness and all of these things. And the dragon is trying to lie to you. As if God has forgotten you. Telling you to go back to the world. Where at least you won't be dry in a desert. You'll at least have some comfort zone. You know, he did the same thing to the children of Israel. If you remember, they, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Where at least they would have a better meal. But never forget that Lucifer is the father of all lies. It's what he does. And he's such a good liar that he's lied to himself. He's convinced himself. That's, oh wow. He's such a deceiver, he's deceived himself. To think he can actually come against the Most High God. Brothers and sisters. I want to tell you that when God brought me back to that seven-year-old prophetic word and I started to meditate, because remember the first half is directly to you, the second half is going to be directly to the descendants of Ishmael, the Arab nations and those in Islam. Because right now, these nations are stirring up and gathering together to wage war against Israel. To come against and fight anybody that declares themselves a Jew, whether they are one or not. So this is a plea from the Most High God to reach out to as many as possible. And there's no need for you to turn away and shut off this message. What are you afraid of? Hear the word of the Lord. Because you're not promised tomorrow. And if you're wrong about Jesus Christ... If you only accept him as a prophet, if you deny that he shed his blood for you because you can never earn your way to heaven. If you deny his death on the cross and his burial and resurrection, you will go to hell and you will be cast into the lake of fire. Whether you are in Islam or whether you are a Jew that has rejected the true Messiah, no matter what, if you do not receive him and believe him. You will burn for eternity. So hear the word of the Lord. But I want to talk to you. I want you to hear the word of the Lord. The place that you're in is for a reason. The struggle you're going through is for a reason. These messages are called crying in the wilderness. Do you hear the voice of God? Or have you been getting caught up in the cares of this world? What I want us to do, you and I, we're going to break down some scriptures. We're going to go over some scriptures. And then it's going to transition. Similar scriptures and even same scriptures that are going to be meant for you on one end will be meant for the descendants of Ishmael on another end. Are you ready? I want you to go to Genesis chapter 16. Now in verse 1, to save time, can we just paraphrase a little bit? Most of you know the story. This is not just a story. This is history. This really happened. This is not just the book of the Most High God. This is a historical record. You understand? Remember that Abraham and Sarah... She could not give birth. She was losing hope and having doubt at such an old age. She finally gave in and said, have my servant Hagar impregnate her and through her I will have children. And indeed it does come to pass and Abraham goes in unto Hagar, the Egyptian, and she gives birth to a boy named Ishmael. And Abraham loved Ishmael so much. So much.
But then of course there's contention, you know? There's emotions involved. And there feels like there's mockery involved and there's an envy, there's a jealousy, there's a spitefulness going on. There's tension between the mother of Ishmael, the Egyptian, and the wife of Abraham, Sarah. And there's an interesting part because when you go down to verse 10, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord had heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Can't you see the descendants of Ishmael in this last hour? The violence that happens in the Middle East. This is prophecy, brothers and sisters. But I want you to see this. And she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Be'er Shabbai Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abraham's son, bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. But as you know, as the historical story proceeds and continues, that God keeps his promise with Abraham. And he visits Abraham. And he speaks life into the womb of his wife, Sarah. But the fact that the Most High God visited Abraham literally, literally, in physical form, God Almighty visited Abraham. The Messiah, Christ, visited Abraham. He wanted Abraham to know, you are a friend to me, and I have not forgot you. I have not forgotten you. You will, your wife will become pregnant and you will have a son named Isaac. Could you imagine how excited Abraham was? But do you think he stopped loving Ishmael, his firstborn? Abraham loved both his sons. But as tension grew, it came to a time, it came to a place where Abraham had to make a decision. He had to make a decision. And look, if you're a father or a mother, even if you're not a parent, could you imagine as a friend of God having to choose to prove your love and your obedience to the Most High God that he would have to send his son away. The son that he loves so much. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the wording so you can hear it. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 17. I want you to see what Abraham says. And I will, in verse 16, the Most High God says, And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yeah, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear a child? But look what Abraham says next. Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live 
before thee. Notice that when he says, may Ishmael live before thee, O God, there's an exclamation point. That means he said it with a lot of passion. He truly loved his son. But God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Did you hear this? So God let Abraham know, Isaac is the one I have chosen, but I have not forgotten Ishmael. But let's go now. Let's go to one of the most grieving, one of the hardest moments of Abraham's life. I want you to walk with me. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 21. I want you to see what it says. We're going to start at verse 8 going down. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Did you hear this? And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of the bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is your seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the shrubs, a bush. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. And she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God had heard the voice of the lad where he is. Did you hear that? Arise and lift up the lad and hold him in thy hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. Are you hearing this? And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. And God was with the lad. And he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer and dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. I want you to think about this now. This is directly to you before we speak prophetically to, the, to those of the descendants of Ishmael and those in the Arab nations and those in Islam. I want to speak to you. There's many of you that have been feeling hopeless. You have felt casted away like Ishmael and his mother. You have felt like God has forgotten you. I tell you, one of the greatest wounds that Ishmael suffered, and we're going to talk about this generational curse, because all nationalities, no matter what nation, a tribe, or tongue, have suffered from generational curses that only Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, can break. But one of them for him was rejection and abandonment. There's many of you that feel rejected. You feel abandoned. And you feel like God don't care. Because you're struggling. It almost feels like you only have a bottle of water. But he's the God of heaven and earth. He could give you a pool of water. He's the God of heaven and earth. He can give you 
miles and miles of food to supply your very needs instead of a little loaf of bread and send you on your way. Have you ever considered why would Abraham, a righteous man who clearly loved his son Ishmael, why would he, and, and let's make it very clear, Abraham was not poor. Abraham was actually very rich. And if you were to read this from the carnal perspective, if you're in the midst of the field of the beasts, instead of above in the heavenly realm with the eagles, you might get offended by this and be like, this is not right, God. Why would you do this to Ishmael? Why would you do this to his mother? Why would Abraham send off his firstborn son with a bottle of water and a loaf of bread into the desert? Do you think he did it because he's evil? He don't care. Or do you think he had to do it so the Most High God could declare a, pray, a prophetic message that servants of the Most High God will be able to show you? Because some of you feel that way. You feel like I'm barely getting by, Lord. I'm barely getting by in the natural realm, struggling day by day, even to pay the bills, worrying about having meals for the rest of the week for my children. I'm struggling in the desert in my mind. I, I feel drained. I have no joy. I'm struggling. And, and Lord, I, I want you to help me. But do you love me? Do you care for me? Or have you turned your back on me because I feel alone in this last hour? There's many of you that have been feeling this way on one level or the next. But the blessing is in the bottle. You know, in the world, in that demonic realm, they call it a genie in the bottle. And notice that 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 started off in like Arab traditions from at least my understanding. I may be wrong, but they, the genie in the bottle. But that's a lie. The blessing is in the bottle. And I'm going to tell you why. Notice that in her time of need, it caused her to cry out. And Ishmael cried out, but God heard him. And it ain't that God just don't care about her cry, but you have to understand God goes to the man. It's like when Adam made the mistake, even though Eve sinned first, God went to Adam first. You understand he's a God of principle. He's a God of decency and order. So even as a young lad, he went to the lad. But listen to this carefully. Could there be a revelation that's going to change your life? There is. That in this moment, he allowed them to go off into the desert with only a bottle of water and a loaf of bread because he wanted them to know something and he wants you to know this right now that he will provide water in the desert because at that moment he heard his cry he heard the cry of Ishmael and he provided a well he provided a well of water he hasn't forgotten you brothers and sisters but I'm going to tell you why I told, I'm going to explain why I said the blessing is in the bottle. I'm going to explain this to you. First, before we do that, who is water? According to the word of the Lord in the New Testament. Remember, we are in the New Testament. That means we read the Old Testament. Yes, we can study the Old Testament. But the New Testament is the way that God came to the earth and showed us. A new way. If you go through the scriptures, I want you to go to the book of Ephesians. Turn to chapter 5. Look at what it says. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Did you hear that? So the word is the water. But the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made by him. And then it goes on to say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who became flesh? Jesus Christ, the almighty, took upon a human body to save us. 
a body was prepared, the Bible says. He had to shed the blood. But remember, this was not just any type of blood. This was God's prepared blood. It says that in the book of Acts. So Jesus is the water. I want you to go to John chapter 7. Look at what it says in 37. It says in the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Did you hear that? Jesus was crying in the desert. He went and fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, in the desert. But make no mistake about it. It was a desert all on the earth because without God coming to the earth as the word made flesh, no one had water to make it into heaven. No eternal water. You know, there's a lot of sayings, just like the genie in the, in the bottle was really a mockery to try to blind people from the blessing of the bottle that I'm telling you about. Remember in Greek mythology and one of them, they would talk about the fountain of youth, right? To live forever. You drink of this water. Where do you think they stole that from? Jesus is the water that if we don't drink, we cannot make it. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 21. Watch this. Look at what it says in verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. This is Jesus Christ speaking. You do know this, right? But watch this. Let's go back to John. I want you to go to chapter 4. I saved this for last for a reason. Look at what it says in verse 13 going down. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Did you hear that? Notice that the woman says unto him, Sir, give me that water, and I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. But the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, You're right. Remember that? And then she ran off and started telling people. Notice that in that moment, Hagar didn't have a husband anymore. Abraham sent her away. But yet she met a well. Ah. Jesus is letting it be known, I am the water of life. I am the well of life. Notice that Hagar and Ishmael received the blessing at the last minute of their life. As they're about to die of thirst in the desert. The Lord hears the cry of Ishmael and provides water in the desert, a well at that last minute. Now that we've talked about this, now that we've talked about this, I want to speak to you about the blessing of the bottle. Do you want to know that Abraham doing that for his son was one of the greatest things he could have ever done? Abraham could have sent Hagar and his son Ishmael that he loved so dearly. I, I just want to remind you that. Yes, of course he loved Isaac. But he loved Ishmael too. He could have sent Hagar off with servants, camels, I mean gallons of water, tons of food, silver, whatever type of wealth that she could buy and get ahead in life. He could have done that. And maybe he wanted to do that. See, we don't know everything because not everything is written. Remember, the Bible says that if, if it was recorded, everything that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Almighty did, there wouldn't be enough books to write it in. So there's so much more that we will find out about when we're with Christ forever. But who knows what Abraham's desire was and Christ said, no, you, you cannot do that, Abraham. Send Ishmael and Hagar off with a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. I have a plan. 
I cannot cause them or their descendants to think it was the beast of the field that kept them alive. It has to be a heavenly, supernatural, divine intervention. It has to be known. It wasn't the wealth of silver and gold and the help of servants that went with them and camels and all of these things. No, they had to get to a place of despair. Ah, Lord. They had to get to a place of brokenness. They had to get to a place where they felt like God forgotten them. It was bad enough. My own father, Abraham, has rejected me. My mother sending me off into this bush to lay under this bush and die of thirst. But not only did my father Abraham reject me, but his God has rejected me. But brothers and sisters, the blessing is in the bottle. Because the bottle is a reminder that you need me everywhere you go. See, this is the message for you. We're going to send this message to the descendants of Ishmael, to the Arab nations and those in Islam. But before we do that, I need you to know that the blessing is in the bottle. See, you go through hard times, you may go through struggles, you may feel like you barely get by, but God wants you to never forget that you need to rely on him. Because if he gives you a pool of water, if he gives you a supermarket full of food that you have access to and you never go through a struggle, you may forget how much you need him to survive. And you may start thinking you're surviving because of water and because of food and because of silver and gold and money and the help of servants and men. But he wants you to know every day that bottle will run out and you're gonna need if you're gonna need a new fill. You're gonna need a new filling of that water to survive. That every day you're gonna need me, Ishmael. And the same thing that the most high God is saying through me, his servant to you, every day you need him. See, that's the blessing of the bottle. It's a reminder. Brothers and sisters, it is a reminder. This bottle right here. I'm going to finish this at some point and it's going to be empty. And if I was traveling through the wilderness and through the desert and through the lands, all the way down through Egypt, I can't get rid of this because this is what I need to contain more water. I'm going to find water. I ran out of water, but now I figured out the mystery that the God of Abraham is my God. And he's going to provide water one way or the other. And me keeping this bottle is my faith. It's showing a, a sign of faith that I'm going to hold on to this bottle because I know he'll provide the water. Some of you might say, well, what does it mean by bottle? See, this is the beautiful thing about this message. Did you know that the word bottle in Hebrew actually meant the skin of an animal, especially in, in particular, the skin of a lamb. That the, the skin of the lamb would be, would be formed into a bottle. Don't think of a bottle like a plastic or a glass that we have modern day terms. This was a pouch, you could say, that they would fill with water. Do you think it is a coincidence that not only would the blessing be in the bottle, but it would represent Jesus Christ because he is the lamb of God and without him, you can't have his water. He's not only the living water, he's the carrier of the water. I got to go. You see, when he walked the earth and he became flesh and dwelt among us, the word is water. He was the bottle made flesh. He was giving us water everywhere we went. He was saying, come drink. I am the bottle. I am that prophesied bottle of water, the lamb skin to carry the water. Why do you think? Ah, when he was on the cross, they stabbed him and out came water. I wanted you to know that the blessing is in the bottle. You may not get everything you want. You may go through struggles at times. And there may be times where God gives you grace and favor and blesses you and you get blessed abundantly. But be careful. Oh, wow. 
Be careful. Because I remember what happened to David. When he had a bottle. <laughs> when he was a shepherd and had a bottle. Let's just hypothetically say he wasn't a king. He wasn't rich. He wasn't wealthy. He wasn't even respected by his own father and brothers. They mocked him. He knew about that water. He put his trust in the Lord to the point he was able to kill a bear and a lion. And he was the one to stand against Goliath with no fear. Because he knew his living water was with him. And he knew at times of need, he could always rely on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But after he became king and wealth kicked in and all of these things, he started to forget the bottle. He started to forget the bottle and he ended up sinning. And he impregnated another man's wife by the name of Bathsheba. Almost sounds like the name of that well, doesn't it? And he gets caught up in pride. He tries to hide the sin and try to get the husband Uriah to lay with his wife to cover up the pregnancy and eventually has Uriah killed. He forgot the bottle. He forgot that lambskin pouch that kept him humble. See, the blessing of the bottle, oh Lord, the blessing of the bottle is it keeps you humble. You know, there's a scripture in, I believe, Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, don't hold me to it. It says, Lord, don't give me too much where I get full and forget you. Don't give me too little where I got to steal and take your name in vain. Just give me enough. Just give me enough. Just give me that bottle's worth every day. Because when that water runs out, it's going to cause me to cry out unto you. It's going to cause me to remember you're my source of life. Not men. Not other things. You are the provider of life in my life. Without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I will die in a desert. But as long as I hold on to this bottle, it's a reminder of how precious I am to you and how my life is in your hands. And if you choose not to give me water, then you're calling me home. But if you want to give me another day in this, in this, on this earth, you will provide water, even if it looks impossible, even if I'm laying down in a bush and my mother's over there weeping. You will provide water. You will make a way where there seems to be no way. Wow. So when you're going through hard times, when you're going through the struggle, when you feel rejected and abandoned in a desert with just a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. Understand how much he loves you to bless you to be in that position. Because the chances of the rich making it in. I, I got I to gotta go, y'all. The chances of, of the rich making it in. Why? Because they got everything they need. They forget the bottle. They forget their provisions come from the Most High God. Wow. But what if I told you it goes deeper? Man, I struggle with the name for this message. Should I just give it the original name, Water in the Desert? The Blessing in the Bottle? Or a reason to cry? A reason to cry? Wow. Did you know that Ishmael, his name means God will hear? Oh, oh, come on. God will hear. But that's when it hit me. Because I was wondering, I'm like, Lord, I'm in the middle of doing this documentary. And documentaries take many hours, brothers and sisters. So don't be offended if not every single one of you gets a call back or a response. Just know we are praying for you. There's many responsibilities, but make no mistake about it. We are praying for you and we love you. Pray for us. But I'm like, Lord, this documentary is taking time. You want me to stop and go research this prophetic message I, I released seven years ago? What are you showing me? And because I obeyed him, he's given me such a great gift. You see, the, the increase 
the law of preservation on this prophetic message has so blessed me. And I hope it blesses you that love the Lord. A reason to cry. Listen to this carefully. Ishmael's name has a meaning. You see, I got a message coming out about the power of names, Lord willing. But Ishmael's name has a powerful meaning, but it must be activated. Ah, Are you hearing me? The only way to activate his, the meaning of his name that God will hear is if he gets to a place and has a reason to cry. Ah, see, a lot of you are going through the struggle, but you're not in that place yet where you have that reason to cry to the Lord. And if you don't cry to him, why would he lean his ear to hear you? Mothers out there. When your baby is quiet in the crib, what you going to do? Maybe, yeah, you're going to check on him, but hypothetically saying you've got things to do in the house. But when that baby cries, it moves you to go check on your son or daughter. Fathers out there, same way. You see, the mystery is God will allow you to go into a desert to activate the name. He allowed Ishmael and Hagar to go into the desert to activate the name. Hagar means flight. You know, make sure your flight is not in the winter. That means flee. While Sarah means princess. Are you hearing this? Listen, no, no, no. Stay where you're at. Are you hearing this? God will allow you to go to a place where all you got is a bottle of water and a loaf of bread because he needs to bring, he needs to bring you to a place where you got no choice but to cry to him. And once you cry to him, he moves with compassion and says, now, now I'm going to help you because you have cried unto me. I'm not talking about carnal ungrateful, complaining. I'm talking about a broken place. You need a reason to cry. But if you complain and you don't see the wisdom in why God allows you to go through the things you do when at times you felt rejected, you felt neglected, you felt abandoned, you felt like God didn't care. The reason why the enemy came slithering in because he didn't want you to have a reason to cry unto the Lord but instead walk away back into the world. But the minute God heard the cry, the name of Ishmael was activated. God heard his cry. He heard the mother too, ladies, don't get offended, but he heard his son Ishmael. So you have to be brought to a place where spiritually, now I know your name is Ishmael for the most of you, but spiritually that has to activate in you. Because if God is going to listen, he's got to listen to a cry. He's got to listen to a sincere cry. But brothers and sisters, what if I told you this goes deeper though, because now we got to transition. If you don't mind, we got a, we got billions in Arab nations that need to know the truth of who they are and how much the Lord loves them. Because right now, many of them are gathering together to wage war against Israel and it's not going to be good. So as a messenger of the most high God, I am reaching out to as many across the earth to hear the cry, to understand the mystery. So now that y'all know the blessing is in the bottle, 
And when you're going through hard times, it isn't because God and Abraham didn't love you, didn't care about you, sent you into the desert. No, God had a plan. He has to make sure that you always know and always remember that you cannot live without the Lamb of God to carry the water for you everywhere you go. But let's talk about this. Descendants of Ishmael, those in Arab nations and those within Islam. You're making a grave mistake. Repent. Don't let hatred in your heart. I know it's terrible what's going on and it seems unjust. Just as I can speak to the land of Israel and to the people of Israel, there are things happening to them that are wrong and unjust. But if you murder each other, Without Christ, you will all perish. The prophecies will come to pass when Jerusalem is in, when Israel and Jerusalem is surrounded. We know what the word says will happen. And remember that Isaac's name means he laughs. And I know at times you feel like those in Israel are mocking you. They're laughing at your suffering. They're laughing at your pain. And there's a constant wave of retaliation where now you want to see them suffer and then they want to see you suffer. No different than the bloods want to kill the Crips and the Crips want to kill the bloods. And it's a constant cycle. Nation against nation, the flood of ethnos swallowing anybody up in their path, in its path, if they're not raising above as eagle wings in Christ. I am here to give you a message from the Most High God, O oh, descendants of Ishmael. God has not forgotten you. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear the word of the Lord. What would be the odds that in the last hour, Many are turning their lives over to Christ and coming up out of Islam and serving the true and living God. And that Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth is visiting many in the Arab nations in their dreams. They're getting open visions during broad day. In the middle of the day. And they're saying, wait a minute, is this Isa? Who is this? And they're finding out this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of God. You see, the deception of man can only last so long when the power of God visits somebody, no matter what false religion they're in. Wow. So as the dragon wants to try to deceive many in the United States and other countries to hate Arab nations and to want Iran to be wiped off the map and all of these nations to be wiped off the map, have you considered there are many becoming saved? You just don't know about it. The question is, have you been praying for the gospel to be brought in these places? And there are many within Israel, within the Jewish community that are turning their lives over to Jesus Christ. You just don't know about it. Now, many may not mean billions, although it's the Father's will that none perish, but everyone to receive Christ. All the angels in heaven rejoice over one soul that is saved out of Islam and they give their life to Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. So imagine, imagine. So if you're not caught up in the flood of ethnos and you're rising as an eagle, you'll start to pay attention to the bigger picture. Listen to this carefully. The same way Christ is visiting many in the Arab nations, the descendants of Ishmael in the very last hour. Notice it's in the last minute. God is moving and he's about to make a move even greater. And his sign is that water is literally appearing in the desert. That was the confirmation I needed. Can't you see the revelation that in Ishmael's last hour, the last hour of his life as he's about to perish, 
God provides water in the desert. This was a prophetic message that in the last hour of Ishmael's descendants, in the very end of days, God would provide a well in the desert, in the spirit realm, an opportunity for those in Arab nations to turn to the living water and drink from the lambskin. Will you help spread this message? Will you pray for the power of God to be so strong on those that watch this video? To repent and give their life to love made flesh because God is love and love is Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And he loves you so much. And when you look at the generational curses that come from many, many curses from many bloodlines. But if we focus in on the generational curses of the descendants of Ishmael, one of the biggest strongholds is the curse of rejection and abandonment. You see, the way generational curses travel is through the bloodline. We know that because we inherited the curse from Adam and Eve. And it was only because Jesus Christ came to the earth and started a new generation that we could be born again in the spirit to be delivered from the curse. The word of God says he became a curse on the tree that we could be delivered from the curses. How awesome is the God we serve? He died that we may live. Oh, come on. Let me hold on to that for after. So that generational curse is so many of you, descendants of Ishmael, of Ishmael, in the Arab nations, is that curse of rejection and abandonment. And you can only imagine how it could stir up envy and jealousy. Think about what I'm saying to you. Knowing that Isaac got blessed. He got to stay with his father. And yet my father sent me away into the desert with a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. My mother weeping while his mother, while Isaac and his mother live like, like a little prince and a princess. And, and on top of that, his name means he laughs. I feel like he's laughing at me. I feel rejected and abandoned and it's making me angry and now I hate Isaac. You see? Can you see it? But I'm here to tell you, you're not rejected, O oh descendants of Ishmael. All you of Arab nations, you are not rejected. God has not forgotten you. You have forgotten God. And the reason why so much is happening is because you're turning to the wrong one. God is a jealous God. And the dragon had a plan to attack the descendants of Ishmael and lie to them and deceive them to serve another and to reject the true and living Messiah. I want you to see this in the spirit. And if you are a follower of Christ, you need to be praying for the descendants of Ishmael. Just as you pray for the descendants of Isaac. Just as you pray for the Jews, you pray for those in Gaza. You pray for those in Islam. Pray that as many can be saved, will get saved and stay saved. God has extended his hands. He's providing water in the desert. Will you drink? Will you drink of Christ in this last hour? Will you receive him, not as Esau the prophet, but as the mighty son of God? The word made flesh. He's your only hope. You have not experienced love until you receive. Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You have not received peace because there is no peace for the wicked, the Bible says. And this is what I want to tell you. 
What if I told you that Christ has such a great plan for the descendants of Ishmael, for the bloodline of Ishmael, the Arab nations? You're such a special people. You're such a special people. You have gone through so much struggle, but the prophecies are very clear. You have gone through so much struggle, so much pain. You think it is a coincidence that you have been taught that no matter what happens, bombs could drop, families are wiped out, but they shout. God is the greatest. But the problem is you're not shouting to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But yet it's in the name of your father, Ishmael, to cry out that God would hear. The problem is you're crying out, but because you're not crying out to the God of your father, Abraham, God can't hear you. But if you would just cry out to the true and living God, if you would just cry to Jesus Christ, he will hear you and visit you. And the dragon knows this mystery. He knows in the Arab nations that blessing, that name Ishmael. So what does he do? He sends deception. And another gospel, which is not Christ, and tricks billions to cry out, but not to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So the name is activated, ah, but it isn't activated for Christ. And because you're not crying out to Jesus Christ, this means he's not going to incline his ear because he's a jealous God. But I'm saying to you, no matter what nation you're in, no matter what Arab nation you're in, if you cry out to the Lord, if you pray with me, he's going to hear you. And I'm going to pray that he visits you. I'm going to pray because, oh, descendants of Ishmael, your dedication to pray three times a day, your dedication to abstain from things and your obedience is admirable. But if you're not doing it to the true and living God, Yeshua the Messiah, it is in vain. And the dragon does not want you to go back to the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Ishmael's father, Abraham, because he knows he will be in big trouble if the descendants of Ishmael start to cry out to the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But I want to tell you, this is how much Christ loves you. For years, Christians, come on, brothers and sisters, we always talk about how much the Lord loves Israel, how much the Lord loves the descendants of Isaac, how much the Lord loves the Jewish people. Even as they reject him, there are those that are waking up and I know they're called Messianic Jews, but let's just say they become followers of the true Messiah. And may the Lord richly bless them, the descendants of Isaac. We love you, Israel. We love you. But we love you, Ishmael. We love you, descendants of Ishmael, as well. And we have to be fair that it, it, if you brothers and sisters would stop overly favoring Isaac and pray for Ishmael as well, Maybe that will destroy that generational curse of bitterness and hatred and rejection and abandonment. And to let you know that God hasn't rejected you. He's always had a plan for you. Oh, descendants of Ishmael. Oh, Arab nations. He's had a plan from the beginning. It's up to you. If you turn to this well of water, if you cry out to Jesus Christ, he will hear you. The name of your forefather, the name of Ishmael, God hears, will activate. Because he's not hearing you cry out to another. What if I told you 
that when Jesus Christ walked the earth, he was letting it be known that he is the well of life, the water to give to those that are thirsty in the desert of the world where there was no hope. Where the religious leaders of that time didn't even know God to the point when God came to the earth and dwelt among us in flesh. They didn't recognize him and not only did they not recognize him, they hated him and had him crucified to the tree, to the cross. But make no mistake about it. God had to go into death to conquer death and take back the keys of death, hell and the grave. And he rose from the dead on the third day. I don't care if you were raised to believe it's a lie. It is the truth. And if you say God can't die, you're saying death is more powerful than God. God went into death and broke it. That whoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to this carefully. Jesus Christ, what if I told you, descendants of Ishmael and all of you brothers and sisters, what if I told you that the same way Jesus had to die that we may live, that he took upon the curses that we may be blessed. What if I told you that he was thirsty, that we may receive water? What if I told you that in the last hour of his life, he also was thirsty. Ah. Oh, Lord. Go to John chapter 19. Quickly. Look at what it says. Verse 28. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be filled, said, I am thirsty. I thirst. Are you hearing me? Oh, descendants of Ishmael, a nation that has so much potential to have so much power in the gospel, to even provoke Christians to godly jealousy, the way you dedicate yourself to prayer. If you would just pray to the true Messiah, he was thirsty in the last hour of his life, just as your father Ishmael was in the desert. But he died on that cross that you could live. He was thirsty that you may drink. He was telling you something. Oh, descendants of Ishmael and all the children of the earth. Will you drink of this water? He went thirsty that you could have this bottle. That you could have this lamb skin bottle. He had to die. He was thirsty on that cross that you could drink. Will you drink? Will you drink the water of life? Look at what God is allowing to happen in your countries. Look at the earthquakes. Look at the floods. Look at these things. He is getting your attention, O oh Ishmael, O oh descendants of Ishmael. When will you realize? The enemy had a plan for you and God has a greater one. If you would receive him for who he is, he will hear your cry. When you have a reason to cry and to cry to the true and living Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, not Isa, not Isa the prophet, but Jesus Christ, the son of God. God has a son. Whoever told you he don't is lying to you. God has a son. And he's coming back. Sooner than you think. Brothers and sisters. I want to tell you that this goes deeper. And I'm going to show you. Did you know in the book of Genesis... In chapter 17, you read it on your own time. I just want to do it to save time. Isaac was circumcised on the eighth day, but Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13 years old. And if you know in the New Testament, we are to be circumcised in the heart. When we repent and give our life to Christ, we are circumcised in our heart. Can't you see? 
that Ishmael was circumcised late in his childhood. This was also a prophecy that the descendants of Ishmael in the last days, yeah, they may be late, but they're going to start giving their life to Christ. It may not be by the billions, but those that are his will be called out and they will get circumcised in their heart. While many were circumcised on the eighth day, but don't you forget, oh, you Christians, don't you forget, oh, you people of Israel, that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And I'm telling you right now, if those in the descendants of Ishmael, those in the Arab nations turn to Jesus Christ, they have been already taught to pray more than most of you. They've been taught to be more obedient than most of you in Christianity. Imagine when they give their life to Christ. Imagine their dedication. If many of them are willing to die for another gospel, how much more will they die for the true gospel? But they won't die doing violence unto men. That generational curse that was spoken will be broken when they receive the king of peace into their heart. Even the very details, how Abraham rise up early in the morning. Notice how they rise up early to pray. How God heard the cry of Ishmael, not, the, not Hagar, even though, she, even though she cried. He loves her. Notice how in Islam, it's the men who are heard and the women are really not heard like that. You get what I'm saying. Can't you see the details are even down to the minute. Wow. But what if I told you there's more? I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 25. Are you ready for this? Go to Genesis chapter 25. I want you to see this revelation. Verse 7 going down. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred, three score, and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now listen carefully. O oh, you descendants of Isaac, O oh, you descendants of Ishmael, listen carefully, O oh, people of Israel. Listen carefully, O oh, people of Arab nations. I want you to listen carefully. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave at Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. Did you, did you hear that? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isaac and Ishmael were brought together at the death of their father, Abraham. Can't you see the prophetic revelation that the Most High God is showing you? That it was at the death of Abraham that brought Ishmael and Isaac together to acknowledge his death. Can't you see? That the death of Jesus Christ, that the death of Jesus Christ is what will bring the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael together in him. It is acknowledging the death of Jesus Christ. That is the only way to bring peace between these nations. The only way to bring peace is to acknowledge the death of Jesus Christ and how he rose from the dead. The same way they had to acknowledge their father Abraham died. I must go back. I must meet with my brother. We must put aside differences and bury our father. You must put aside differences and acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Lord God. Acknowledge that he died for you. Acknowledge that he shed his blood for you. Acknowledge that he rose from the dead for you. But brothers and sisters, that's when it hit me. Seven years ago, brothers and sisters, please hear the word of the Lord. Many of you know by now, there is a prophecy. Such an amazing revelation that many have found out about. 
the first 10 names from Adam to Noah. Remember that names have power. Actually spell a prophetic message about Jesus Christ. I'm sure many of you know about this by now. And if you don't know about it, your life is never going to be the same. Did you know that if you line up the names in order from Adam all the way to Noah, 10 generations and line up their names and what their names actually mean, it spells a, it, it declares the prophecy of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Adam means man. Then after that, it's Seth, which means appointed. Then it's Enosh, which means mortal. Then it's Kenan, which means sorrow. Then it's Mahalalel, which means the blessed God. Then it's Jared, which means descend or shall come down. Then it's Enoch, which means teaching. Then Methuselah, which means his death will bring. After that is Lamech, which means the hopeless. And then finally Noah, which means comfort or rest. Did you hear that? See, if you line up the names, it literally says man is appointed mortal sorrow. However, the blessed God shall come down teaching and his death shall bring the hopeless rest. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, do you know what the odds are? The statistic odds of that being just a mere coincidence? Or do you believe that God put it there to prove? You see, we walk by faith and not by sight, but he's so gracious. He gives us these revelations to strengthen our faith that we truly serve the living God. And that he really has a son. The Old Testament says, what is his name and what is his son's name? But what if I told you, the Lord revealed to me that there's also a hidden message concerning the 12 princes of Ishmael. Remember earlier we read that. Ishmael had 12 princes. Wow. Are you ready for this? Let me take a drink of my water because I want to be reminded that the blessing is in the bottle. Do you got a drink? Why don't you go ahead and take a sip of your tea, your, 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 your water, whatever you got. Let's remember that the blessing is in the bottle. It ain't no genie in a bottle. It's Jesus in a bottle. And I'm reminded that I need him every single day. I can't live without him. And I can't go too far and, and, and think that it's other things that keep me alive. It's him that keeps me alive. The blessing is in the bottle. Now I got these written down because this is not easy to memorize. You ready for this? The 12 princes of Ishmael spell out a prophetic word. The first prince is Nabajoth. Now I may pronounce names a little off. Look, I don't. I don't claim to be a Mr. Know-it-all. Sometimes I don't pronounce words and names, uh, you know, accurately, but that's okay. Maybe you're better than me in that area, but together we could walk in humility. Hear this. Hear the meanings. Nebajoth, the first prince, is pronounced two ways. It's also Nebaioth, and it means a high place. And it means prophecy. Wow. Just like in Isaiah 60 verse 7. Talks about the rams of Nebaioth. The next prince in order now is Kadar. This means to become dark. And it also means sorrow. 
This is why in Psalms 120 verse 5, David talks about the tents of Kedar because they were made of black hair and it meant to be cut off from worship. Are you hearing this? This is so strong, y'all. The next name, the third prince, is Abdil. And it literally means to be chastened by God and God's disciplined. Are you writing these down? The next is Mibsum. It means a sweet smell. After that is Mishma. Prince Mishma means hearing and obeying. Wow. However, the next prince is Duma, which means a place of silence or the silence of death. The next prince is Masa, which means a burden or to bear or carry. Wow. The next prince of Ishmael is Hadar, which literally means fierce and mighty and also glory. The next is Tima, which means a desert. But it also means consummation. This means to be married by intimacy. And it also means right hand. <laughs> the next prince is Jetur. I believe is how it's pronounced. It means to surround or enclose the encampment of nomads. But it also means to inherit a title or the word succession. Next we have Prince Nafish. That means to be refreshed or to take a breath. <laughs> oh Lord. And it means he that rest. And finally, the 12th Prince is Kidama. And this means the first ancient in the origin. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Brothers and sisters, I need you to help me. Let's do our best to try to read this as a sentence. High places. There will be a prophecy. Now, high places can also represent wickedness because Paul said there will be spiritual wickedness in high places, right? The descendants of Ishmael will become dark and go through sorrow. And remember that this represented the tents of Kedar, which means to be cut off from worship. Although they will pray, they will cry out. They have been cut off because they have rejected Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Almighty. Although they will continue to be chastened by God and disciplined, they will still pray faithfully because Mibsa means a sweet smell. And you know in the Bible this represents prayer. They will even be a hearing and obeying people. They'll be told not to eat pork. They won't do it. They'll be told to honor Ramadan. They'll do it. They'll go to Mecca. They'll surround this rock. They will do these things. They will obey. But sadly... They're in a place of silence. That's what Duma means. Even the silence of death because they have rejected the son of God. No matter the work they put in, they hear, they obey, they pray, they lift up sweet smells. They do all of this work, but yet they're in a place of silence. And although they have a burden, they bear and carry this represents the labor, the work, putting in all their work. But Christ is the one who carried the cross. And instead of, instead of acknowledging the cross he carried, they want to carry their own work, thinking they'll earn their way to heaven. This is so strong, brothers and sisters. I'm so humbled. 
I'm so humbled what the Lord reveals to us. He loves us. The question is, do you love him? However, the mighty God, the king of glory has not forgotten the descendants of Ishmael because Hadar means mighty and means glory. That if they meet him back in the desert, which means Tima, there will be a consummation. This is a marriage by intimacy that they will finally turn their lives over to the true and living Messiah and become one with him as he is the husband and we are the bride. Oh, descendants of Ishmael, oh, descendants of Ishmael, he wants you to become one with him as a husband is one with his bride. And although you have traveled as nomads, feeling surrounded at times, and as you give your life to Christ through consummation, spiritually, you will receive the succession. You will inherit a title to be grafted in and be one with the Most High God. And the next prince is Nafish. You will be refreshed and you will finally be able to take a breath and receive the Holy Spirit. Whew. And get the rest you've always wanted. That rest you thought was not for you because that curse of rejection that was put on Ishmael. But God had a plan. He has not rejected you. Have you rejected him is the question. Receive your breath of life. Receive your rest in Christ. And finally, the 12th prince is the first. And the last time I checked, Jesus Christ is the first and the last. Jesus Christ is the ancient of days. Jesus Christ is the origin of life. Lord, you are so good. You know, I wanted to save something for the last. And man, this hit me heavy. This hit me heavy. What if I told you when Abraham was commanded by God to lay Isaac on the altar I believe that there's something in this message that's so prophetic that God has revealed that I want to show you as a messenger of God. Are you ready for it? We'll save time. I got this in my hand. I'll paraphrase it and I'll put scriptures on the screen. Remember in Genesis. This was another very grieving moment because we know that Abraham loves, loved Isaac. Imagine how hard it was to be told he must lay his son on the altar. He must sacrifice his beloved Isaac on the altar for God. Imagine what was going through Abraham's mind as he walked with his son to that mountain. But at the last minute, as Abraham raised the knife, God told him, Abraham, don't do it. For I have provided a ram in the bush. And see, the thing about a ram, it's, it's a shaggy animal. It's similar to sheep and goats, but it has horns that twist and lives nomadic, mountainous. Did you catch it? What if I told you? Oh, this is so good. The reason why God was able to provide the ram in the bush is because of what Abraham did in chapters past. If you go back, when Abraham sent 
his beloved son Ishmael. He loved his son Ishmael. It grieved him so much to have to send his son away. But if you remember very carefully, when Ishmael was about to die, Abraham sacrificed his son, sent him and his mother, Hagar the Egyptian, away. Where was Ishmael thrown into when he was about to die? Was he not in a bush? Uh, symbolically, because Abraham sacrificed Ishmael, this was a prophetic foreshadow that God would provide a ram in the bush when Abraham was about to offer up Isaac, his second son. Because he offered up Ishmael, do you think it is a coincidence that he was at the bush when he was about to die as really a sacrifice because Abraham sacrificed his son by sending him away. It's something he didn't want to do. But in doing that, he didn't realize sending his son Ishmael as a sacrifice away. He would land at a bush that would be a symbolic representation of the ram in the bush. Abraham, because you sacrifice Ishmael, he will represent the ram in the bush. He's the one you had to sacrifice and actually disconnect your life from. I will let Isaac live. And all you descendants of Isaac, humble yourself, O Israel, under the mighty hand of God. Because if it wasn't for Abraham sacrificing Ishmael, only God knows if there would have been a ram in the bush when he raised the knife to Isaac. It's time to come together. It's time to unite. Not Islam and Judaism uniting. Not Catholicism uniting. But uniting in Christ. Acknowledging him as the son of God. Acknowledging his death, burial, and resurrection because death can't hold God. Acknowledging him. Just as Isaac and Ishmael acknowledged Abraham's death and they came together. Will you come together? Will you fight against the enemy, the true enemy that is in high places? Will you raise out of the field of the beast and mount up as eagle wings in the heavenly realm and love one another? Or will you wallow? Or will you be caught away in the flood of ethnos? This is your choice, O men and women of the earth. This is your choice, O people of the earth. No matter what tribe you're from, what nation you're from, what kingdom you're from, you have a choice to turn to Jesus Christ and become a part of the kingdom of heaven where your citizenship is that of the Lord's kingdom of heaven. Where you will have a king who is righteousness itself who is peace itself. And if, as, as God allows me to do this documentary, you will find out the mystery on why we're supposed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We love you all so much. Brothers and sisters, we are truly in the last hour. You better be careful who you're learning from on YouTube that are not ordained to teach you. They don't understand prophecy. They're trying to talk you out of everything. The Trump instead of being heard, they're trying to talk you out of it being what it really is. The Euphrates River drying up, they're trying to talk you out of it. Because these are agents of the enemy and deceived religious people that are not ordained. They're not called to teach. You better be careful who you're learning from. We are in the last hour. Christ is at the door and these prophecies are truly coming to pass. Will you pray with me? O oh, descendants of Isaac, will you pray with me? O oh, descendants of Ishmael, will you pray with me? All of you that do not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, will you pray with me? I want you to say this right now. Say, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Son of the living God, Yeshua, the Almighty, Lord, right now with my own will, I drink from you my well of water. I receive you 
as my Lord and Savior. I acknowledge and declare that you are not just a prophet, you are the Son of God, that you died and shed your blood to save me. You died that I could live. You received the curses that I may be blessed. You were thirsty that I may drink. You rose from the dead on the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Lord Jesus Christ, I give you my life and I renounce all false religions, paganism, everything of mystery Babylon, everything of the new age. I renounce all false gods and I receive the true and living God of heaven and earth, the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lord, I receive you. Now please visit me. Make yourself real to me. Give me a vision, give me a dream. Speak to me somehow, some way, supernaturally, that I cannot deny it. If it be your will, Lord, visit me supernaturally. Lord, I renounce everything of the devil. I renounce every false teaching against you in the gospel and the kingdom of heaven. I renounce all doctrines of devils. I renounce all false religions, teachings, and the curses that came with them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to break all generational curses off of me, of rejection, abandonment, jealousy, envy, hatred, violence, everything from my bloodline that is unclean. Lord, wash it away with the water of the word. Make me new in you, born again. I know you have received me. I am not rejected. I believe and I receive. Lord, change me from the inside out. Make me born again. Give me a great hunger and thirst for you. And love you to the point where I don't care what nobody says. If they threaten to kill me. If I even have to die for your name. That I would rather serve you unto death than bow the knee to a false god. That I don't fear what family and neighbors and people and nations will do unto me because of my faith and conversion in you. I will stand for you. Please give me the strength. I want to know you. I want to know your love. And I want to know your peace. I receive you now. And I reject the teachings of the elders and teachers that have been deceiving my people. I love you, Lord. Save me and use me as a vessel. And may I never forget the blessing of the bottle, that I need you wherever I go, that that bottle will run low and I'll have to cry to you and I'll have a reason to cry and you will hear. I love you, Lord. I give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. Death could not even hold you. The grave could not contain you. Hell trembled at your presence. You are the Most High, the Almighty. There is only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Wow. We love you so much. Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. No matter where you are on the earth, don't be afraid. No, you're not alone. God is raising up a remnant. Although we'd love it to be billions, it is not going to be. But remember that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Stand firm. Study the word. Even if you can't find the Bible, find it online. Seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Pray and fast. And you will see the hand of God. Move on your life as he's already begun right now. Congratulations. 
Now stay in his hands. He that endures to the end will be saved. Don't be the branch that was in the tree and then cast it out of the tree into the fire. Love him above all things. Fear him and not creation. Get ready because he's at the door. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, please pray for us as we pray for you. Thank you for staying with me on this journey of this revelation and mystery that God gave me to serve you as a waiter, as a servant of God, to give you a meal. That's all I am, is a servant, a messenger of God. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. <laughs>